What do you need to be successful in a construction company? Now, many answers to that question, of course, but three I'd like to throw at you here as we kick off today's episode of Construction Genius. Number one, your contract needs to be dialed in, um, not only in its final form, but in all of the iterations that lead to its final form and the forms that follow the final form. You need to be able to control the money in your business and you also need leadership and integrity in the field. All of those things we're going to discuss here today in this episode of Construction Genius with my guest, Michael Wright. Michael is the founder and executive chairman at Red Team Software. And the good news about Michael is that he's not a tech founder in a hoodie and skinny jeans with a ironic tat on his forearm. No, no, no. He is a guy who has deep experience actually working in a construction company. And it's that experience that led him to launch Red Team. Uh, his company ate their own dog food, <laughs> so to speak. And um, he used that experience, saw the benefit of that, and began Red Team as a result. And we have a very interesting conversation around the origin story of his company and that that story itself is very instructive because it will give you insights into some of the challenges that exist between the field and the office and how software can help to solve those challenges in a way that brings the field and the office together and also benefits your customers. And he brings a framework that at least for me was new and so I'm very excited about that. And he describes this in a little bit of detail but I just wanna tease it for you here. And that framework is this, the field is outcome oriented and the office is process oriented. And the conflict between process and outcome is what creates a lot of the tension between the field and the office. And Michael's contention is that one of the ways to solve that is by the implementation of the right software solution in the right situation. So we dive into that in quite a bit of detail. Enjoy my conversation with Michael. I like Michael uh, because he's very thoughtful um, and uh, very articulate around these matters. So I know you're going to find this information um, helpful here today. Of course, check him out at redteam.com um, to learn more about him. And you can connect with him on LinkedIn as well. All that stuff will be in the show notes as well as Michael's um, restaurant recommendation if you are in Orlando. And uh, I hope you enjoy Construction Genius here today. Hey, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Michael, welcome to Construction Genius. Thanks, Eric. Glad to be here. You're kind of unique in the world of construction in that you are a contractor by trade and you also are the founder and the chairman of Red Team Software. Um, take us back in time to how you became a contractor, how you got into the, into the construction business. I'll say first off, I probably was reluctant to get into the <laughs> software business. Uh, you know, I, you know, as a contractor, you know, the, the reason I got here to where I am right now um, was really out of need. And so I was creating, building a, a commercial construction company. And there were things that, that I needed to run my business on a day-to-day -day basis that quite frankly, I just couldn't find in the market. How long were you, tell, take us back in, in terms of um, how you got into construction in the first place. Did you begin your business? How did that all happen? I actually, you know, when I got out of college, um, I worked in finance and accounting for many years, for about 10 years before uh -huh. I got into commercial construction. Um, it was actually my roommate in college that reached out to me. And I was at a point in time in my career where I was looking for a next thing. Um, and he suggested, hey, join me and another partner. Uh, we're building a commercial construction company. Um, and that's how I got in. So it was really, I, I had no construction background other than the fact that you know, I did study, I, I studied architecture and building construction in college. 
Uh, but like a lot of college students, you know, I kind of bounced around. Ultimately, my, my degree was in finance, uh, but I did have some exposure to those, those other disciplines. So when you came into construction, then were you, were you working on the finance side of the business? I was, yep. What, we, what did you learn on the finance side of the business, not, not being a, a contractor by trade coming out of the field? What did you learn about the construction business right away that surprised you? Well, one of the first things um, uh, I saw was there's not a lot of use of technology. Now we're going back to the mid nineties. So <laughs> hey, it goes I had a fax machine and, then, right? <laughs> right, right. Fax machines were still uh, the, an amazing solution for contractors. And remember those return receipts you print out from yeah, the yeah. fax machine, how important those things were? Yeah. yeah. So we'd staple those to the letters and put it into the file. And that was Beautiful. high tech. Beautiful. Yeah. I used to sell fax machines back in the day. So I always have a soft spot for those. <laughs> Awesome. So t tell me, tell me about, you know, as, as you were getting into construction, you're on the finance side of the, 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 the house, you're seeing that there isn't a lot of, you know, heavy adoption of technology. What were some of the impacts of that? What were some of the roadblocks that you were beginning to experience as you began to develop your, your time in the business? Well, one of the first things that, that I, I started working on uh, in the business was getting something called bonding capacity. And I'm sure you and your listeners well know what that is. And, and quite frankly, for a company that's never had any kind of bonding capacity, it's a pretty big lift. Um, and so you have to have financial infrastructure, you have to really understand your numbers, you have to have a very well defined organization and a track record. And so a lot of my focus was there. Um, we didn't have an accounting system that was really designed for construction. And so, you know, I, I went out in the market and tried to find the, the best that I could find uh, to, to handle um, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but quite honestly, much of what we did back then was manual, going back to the fax machines. Um, mm -hmm. There was not a lot of technology solutions for what we're doing. Um, the thing that really struck me about commercial construction was, wow, is this risky? Hmm. You know? And so as I was talking to the sureties and, and really understanding you know, what kind of uh, personal guarantees and indemnifications were required to get that surety credit, um, it really struck me that, that, boy, this is a risky business. And, and having not come from construction, it was really eye-opening for me about how much risk contractors take to, to be in this industry. That's tremendously interesting. And, and as, as you thought about that bonding capacity issue, um, w w was that because you guys were looking to grow and you wanted to, to increase your bonding capacity? Yeah, we were a relatively new company and we wanted working with uh, some some large enterprise clients, and it's something that was important to them. So obviously, it had to be important to us. It's interesting to think about that, though, because the the your ability then to to increase your bonding capacity is related to the um, your ability to get information from your company and present that to the bonding companies. Am I on the right path there? It's exactly that's it. And and so because my background was accounting and finance, uh, I had. Um, a fair amount of background in handling the financial issues, uh, but then there were all the operational issues that had to be addressed as well. Um, and operational issues ultimately become contractual issues uh, because you're either compliant with your contracts or not. And so contracts became a big focus of, of what we had to solve in order to be successful as a contractor. Um, how did that then, let's say um, that issue specifically, how did that then lead you into looking for you know, an, an internal software solution? Well, I mean, the, one of the mistakes that, that people make when they think about contracts is they, they think of contracts as written documents that you kind of make a copy or scan, you staple it together and you put it in a file somewhere. Um, in reality, um, the only reason we write down contracts is because it makes them easier to remember. Mm. You know, the, the truth is that What's contractually binding is really everything you said and did up to the moment you signed the contract and everything you say and do after you sign the contract. Mm -hmm. so the, the truth is that contracts are, are living, breathing things and they're changing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that really is what drives the risk for a contractor is all the promises being made among the contracting parties out on the job site, from the office, everywhere. And so keeping track of all these promises is really existential for the business. Very interesting there. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective there that one of your main jobs is to keep track of the promises. What was your biggest struggle with keeping track of those promises as you were in the business? Uh, the unknown. 
You know, people used to say way back then, it's, it's kind of a, a sad testament on, on the integrity of the business at some point, but uh, people used to say, it's not what you did, it's what you can prove. Yeah. And I, and I used to find that so frustrating because, you know, the way, the way I look at the world, you know, behavior matters and what you say matters. Right. Um, and so losing track of those things creates uncertainty that's essentially inefficient and it creates risk in the, in the industry. What were some of the other challenges that you were noticing that began to sort of uh, chap your hide, so to speak, and, and move you towards um, the, the development of an internal software solution? Well, you know, obviously the challenges around ma- managing information between the office and the field, you know, back in the old days, you know, it was pretty simplistic. We used to get handwritten daily reports and, you know, high tech was figuring out a way to get an employee's time in the field back to the office so that we could create payroll checks. Yep. Uh, but the, the expectations for information sharing these days is very high. Yes. You know, it's, it's not so much, you know, the, the notion of sharing information between the field and the office is almost nostalgic. Right now, the expectation is that everybody can share information in real time, everyone to everyone. And so, um, you know, our technology solutions are actually pretty good at sharing and exposing information that way, but then how do you capture it and archive it so that you are protecting a business and protecting your customers at the same time? So, so you were working, working in, the, in the business uh, as a contractor in, in the construction business for a number of years. What was the first piece of software you decided to get developed? Well, we had a, I had an issue um, way back um, at where I, I actually needed a, a daily report Mm. Uh, and, and back in those days, daily reports were handwritten by our superintendents. And, and like most contractors at that time, one of the big challenges we had was getting our superintendents just to do the daily reports and turn them in at the end of the week. And at some mm. point along the way, um, I'm sure we, we said to our superintendents, listen, if you don't give me five dailies at the end of the week, um, you're not going to get your paycheck. <laughs> That's kind of a harsh position to take. Uh, but, you know, when frustration gets to a certain point, people end up making these, these demands like that. Um, and one day came about that I, I actually needed a daily report from a project um, and I needed a very specific day. And, and so the challenge was, okay, I gotta go find, have somebody find this daily report in a file box in a warehouse somewhere. And so I asked someone to go see if they could find this report. And when they, I was so happy that they showed up and they actually found the document from that day um, but that happiness faded quickly because as I looked at the report itself, what it, the, the first sentence was, I'm filling out this daily report to get my paycheck on Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so the frustration for me was, you know, it wasn't what I needed, obviously, but I had to concede that that's exactly my superintendent did exactly what I asked them to do. Right. And so they were filling out these reports each day, but they knew that it was turned in. And what probably went to somebody in the accounting department and then went into a file and nobody's reading it. Right. And, and so one of the first things that we actually built with software was a way to capture those daily reports. Um, now in the old days, we used to make the superintendents come into the office and fill out the reports on the computer. Mm. Um, but then that information, so they were physically coming into the office at the end of the day, sitting in front of a terminal and, and key the reports into the system. Interesting. Um, but what we did was we we fed those reports into our our week our OAC meeting minutes, and so when we created the OAC for the owner and contractor meeting, we actually listed out all of the comments from the superintendent on the report. That for, we reviewed. forgive me, but tell me what you mean by OAC. That's just for my uh, o- owner and contractor. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so when we'd have a meeting with mm-hmm. our customers, at the end of the week, yes. Um, one of the things we would review is all the notes that were taken by the superintendent over the course of the, the previous period. What was the uh, impact of that when you began that with your owners? What was the impact of that upon them? The owners thought it was great. The biggest impact was on the superintendents because all of a sudden now what they said mattered. What do you mean and, by that? Uh, because they knew that whatever they were putting into their report was going to be presented not only to the management team internally in my business, but also to our customer. Did you you purposely set it up that way to incentivize the the supers or was that just a byproduct that you hadn't thought about? I did. Now it's the project manager that would present the report to the client. Okay. Um, So I actually 
took away the ability of the project managers to edit what the superintendent wrote. Why did so you do what, that? What, because um, what happened was the superintendent and the project manager started talking a lot more because the project manager had to own the comments and he, he or she could not change what the superintendent had written. And so they would start talking and collaborating throughout the week to make sure that this information, the issues were being addressed and that no one's going to get thrown under the bus at the meeting in front of the client. What was the impact of that then on the communication between the field and the office, that classic silo between the project manager and the super? That was transformational. All of a sudden, the superintendent felt really empowered because they felt important in the process. Um, and that's critical. You know, in the field, the field's all about uh, leadership and integrity. Mm. I mean, you have to have a lot of control over the behavior on the job site. Um, but if you take that person's documentation and you throw it into a file somewhere and you never read it, what does that say about how much respect you have for the role and the function in the field? Right. And so by elevating that and highlighting it, like that became the centerpiece of what we shared with our customers. And so it really elevated the, the, the level of, of respect and the, the, the sense of importance for not only what's going on in the field, but for the people that are doing that very difficult work. What was the impact of that then? I mean, I find that so fascinating because I hadn't quite thought about it like that as a, as a means of bridging the gap between the field and the office, as well as establishing credibility with your clients. So that's, that's super helpful, Michael. Um, what was the impact of that then on um, going back to the bonding capacity issue? Did that have an impact upon that? Yeah, well, good surety underwriters, they, they suss out everything that they think um, is going to impact their risk. Right. Uh, and so just just the, the attention to detail and the, the recognition of the, the needs of the folks who were in the field building the projects, um, that distinguishes the organization from, from an underwriting perspective. Um, and so that was certainly part of our story to, to build and grow our bonding capacity. That's excellent. Excellent. Okay. So you began the internal process. Um, you, you had the supers with their dailies. What was the next step that you took? Did you think, well, this, this was kind of cool. Let me try it on another problem. What problem did you address then? Yeah, well, we expanded that, you know, to include pictures now. So pictures from the job site would then flow into those, those, those performance documents that we would present to clients. Um, and, and these things were all, you know, they were, they were built incrementally as we, you know, saw additional challenges to solve. Right. Um, and at some point, at some point, it was it was clear that this was having a transformational impact on our business. And so we decided ultimately to spin it off as a as a separate company. So so the pictures then, um, what year were the pictures being done? Oh, gosh, that was uh, it's probably the late 90s. And so was it was that a digital picture or was it uh... they were they were digital yeah yeah so oh, all the okay. software it, interestingly all the software we built was web yeah really so, wow. yeah it's, it's, i always say it's cloud before cloud yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Had the distinction of cloud software back then um, what, but... what now why did you do it that way what was the did, did you have an insight was it just what was that is that from your background did you have some like guru in in house who sort of knew what was up what was what was going I, on there i had a i had a friend of my, a very close friend of mine who was a a technology genius in okay, his own right that helps and and he suggested you know given the the challenge of managing information from multiple entry points this mm. is really an appropriate application of of internet internet was still new at the time yeah and and so you know, I, I had really nothing to compare it to. So it seemed like a good idea at the time. And we just did it that way. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So at, at, at one point you saw the benefit for your company and then you began um, thinking about spinning it off to just walk us through that, that process a little bit, you know, as you're sitting in the room with your fellow executives, how did you reach that decision? Well, you know, part of it was um, just the, 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 the way our customers reacted to being able to see that information. Uh, my, my surety underwriters, they would want to send other people down from the surety to take a look at what we were doing because they thought it was so not such a novel approach to you know, solving some of the day-to-day -day challenges of commercial construction. Um, and it was really just getting so much positive feedback from people that we decided to, to spin it off. Now, at the time we spun it off, I think it was originally it was 2008, it wasn't software, well, it was a bad time from an economic standpoint, um, but it was also at the time the software wasn't what I describe as productized. 
And right. so a lot of work had to be done to actually create it into a product that we could sell. Uh, but we had some early adopters, even in 2008, that uh, were, were patient with us as we, we built out this infrastructure. So our real go-to-market really wasn't until about 2014. How did you, that's interesting then. So that, that's quite a long time going through the sort of the build out process. It is a long time, but we're also in uh, uh, fi- you know global financial collapse right. time frame. Yeah, so, right, right, right. so it seemed like everything was moving in slow motion at that time. And quite frankly, a lot of contractors went out of business yes. during that period. And, and it was kind of a struggle. So it was really kind of a slow burn to, to, to build out that infrastructure. But for us, honestly, I couldn't imagine running a construction company without that kind of infrastructure. And so it, it wasn't a choice for us to keep it or not use it. it we had to have it to, to actually run our business successfully. Uh, and so we just continued investing at, in it, uh, even if it was a, a slow process. So you're eating your own dog food then? Absolutely. Yeah. That's and I, you know, I remain a, a partner in a, a commercial construction firm, so I'm still fully immersed in the construction industry. And, and that's what keeps me, keeps me uh, having a pulse on, on what's going on in the market, um, how contractors are being innovative, what really are the best practices evolving, even as the, the economics change and the, the way people do business change. You know, the, the biggest challenge um, with uh, owning software on a subscription basis um, is that the world is constantly changing and the software is changing. So to me, one of the most important things when selecting a software vendor is finding people that, that you like, you yeah. agree with, that have similar operating philosophies because it's a relationship. You know, In the old days, you'd buy software, you'd install it on your computer and you just let it run. And one day someone comes and says, you know, that's really obsolete, you need to replace the whole thing. Right, right. Um, I, I think one of the, the key benefits of this, the emergence of cloud software is that it really is a, a business relationship. It's a partnership. And, and so finding the right vendor is finding people that um, you really connect with and that um, you feel like are going to be able to meet and evolve with your needs over time. Okay. So one of the challenges that I see with, with contractors, and I've, I've spoken, I speak quite a bit on this because it, it does, it kind of irritates me a little bit is software folks come along and they've got the easy button in their hand, right? And they're saying, just press this and everything's going to be cool. And contractors are like, well, yeah, you know what? I just want to focus on building relationships and building projects. So here, I, I believe you and let me now write you a check. And then what they get in return for that is, is disappointing. Now, that may not necessarily be all on the software company's fault. It may be on the construction company's fault because they haven't framed their problem well. They haven't you know, set aside a team to implement and things like that. Um, now, obviously, you, know, you, run a, you run a software company. How do you avoid... Well, let me ask you, and this is a challenge, I think. How do you sell your software and yet avoid the easy button pitfalls where people are setting their expectations too high? How do you make that sale? It's, it's something that's very interesting to me. Well, I mean, you, you, that's, that's spot on what you just described. Like the number one reason that software implementations fail is lack of full engagement from, you know, across the entire organization. And, right. and oftentimes, if, if you've got a leadership team that thinks of that as a black box and that you're going to just write a check and, and, it's, and it should fix all these things, um, you're going to be disappointed inevitably. Right. And so the, the key to a successful implementation is, is really engaging the entire organization. Um, so you've got you know, strong leadership commitment to, to what's being done. Right. Um, too often, I think, be, because software is so integrated these days, it inevitably involves, you know, leadership loves the field as they should, right? Because right. that's where you make money. Yep. You make money based on people uh, being successful, building the projects that you have to deliver for your customers. Yep. No doubt about that. Um, oftentimes they think about the back office activities as, as a black box, right? Oh, they print checks and they take customer receipts and, you know, and then they spit out financial statements once a month. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's a mistake. You know, if you're a if you own a construction company, you have a problem with a project. The first thing you do is you go out and look at it. Yeah. Right. You push your eyes on it. And, and I think the, a mistake I've seen made is people don't want to look hard at the administrative processes. You know, the, the field and the back office and the office, 
they're very different places. The field is very naturally outcome oriented. The office is very process oriented. Mm. And so it's two different languages in some mm. way. Um, they can't live without each other. Mm. Um, but, but because there's so much focus on process in the office and so much process, so much focus on outcomes in the field, mm. oftentimes those people butt heads. Mm. And so one of our goals in, in building a, a platform was to integrate the office and the field so that we eliminate the, the, the butting of heads. So that's a great frame there. The outcome oriented aspect of the field and the process oriented aspect of the office creating conflict. Um, so with that sort of that in mind, as, as you're approaching a company, you know, you, you offer, you know, your solutions are everything from pre-construction to, to, you know, reports and analytics, financial management. So, yeah. you know, there's like a, it, it, is it a smorgasbord? Is it one package? How do you, how do you approach a, a company that's, that you're engaging with in terms of figuring out how to, how to, uh, you know, how to best offer your services to them? Uh, well, I mean, first and foremost, we have to find out what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we like to start with the things that are going to have an immediate positive impact on their performance and the, the quality of their organization. And uh, although we, we are pretty insistent upon continuing an ongoing adoption of more and more aspects of what we do, because I think ultimately it delivers the best, the best solution for the business over the long term. Right. Um, we, we try, you know, I don't know that we have any customer that uses 100% of what we do. Right. Uh, but what we do see is that the more that they use, the better off, the better results that they actually experience on the platform. And where do most people start with you? Uh, contracts. You know, okay. I mentioned the, the importance of contracts. Yep. And so, you know, the contracting process is, is a critical part. Uh, I often describe it as the, the foundation of what we do. Yeah. And, and contracts, you know, our approach is not thinking about contracts as a document, as I alluded to earlier. Yeah. Uh, we have this notion of contract formation. And contract formation is really how you, you from, from the very beginning of the relationship with your counterparty, you start negotiating terms and conditions in an online way. And so we actually produce the contract documents for signature, mm -hmm. but along the way, we actually capture all the commentary back and forth among the contracting parties. Mm -hmm. um, and then we memorialize all that commentary with metadata. And so we can tell the entire story of how the contract became what it was. And we can tell the story of how it evolved over the life of the project. And that is, is a much more robust way to think about the contracting process rather than thinking about it as a, a static document. So if I'm thinking of it that way, as opposed to static, what is, what are, what are some of the pitfalls that I'm avoiding on a project or what are some of the benefits that I get? Well, the benefits you get is you understand what's really expected of you. Right. Um, and, and when your project teams start understanding that behavior and comments and what they write, all of that is contractually binding, um, you get a higher level of integrity across the organization. And it, and it goes both ways, right? It, it, it actually protects your customers as much as it protects you as a contractor. Right. Interesting. So then going back to that idea of outcome um, oriented versus process oriented, the field and the office, what are some ways that contractors can begin to, to bring, see, because I do think it's so important to actually articulate that. And, and, and I don't hear, con I, I hear contractors bitching a lot about field and office, right? It always yeah. happens. But yeah. the way that you frame that, I, I, I'd like you to please explain that a little bit more and give us some more, some more color on that, please. Sure, sure. Well, you know, the first thing you got to do is you have to explain to people that they think about these things differently, right? And so, for for people in the field, I always say it it sounds it sounds absolute, but I always say the process is in many ways more important than the end result. Hmm. That's interesting. Right? And it, is it Maya Angelou? Said, How do they respond you know, when you say that? <laughs> uh, usually, the first response is, uh, "What do you mean?" Yeah, right. right. I, I know what I'm building. I know what I need to get there. And, and what I say, what I try and explain is, listen, the process is what people are going to remember. It's what our customers will remember. It's what our subcontractors will remember. Interesting. You know, Maya Angelou said, um, people won't remember what you said. They'll remember how they made you feel. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that's what customers and subcontractors remember, you know, what, you know, how they installed the mechanical systems in the building, all that gets lost in, in a fairly short amount of time once the project is completed, but right. they'll definitely remember how they felt, how, how they were treated over the process. And so process is really, really important from a, from a customer satisfaction perspective. And when I say customers, I'm also including subcontractors because sure. you know, yeah. we have to serve our subcontractors as well as we serve our clients. Absolutely. And for the, for the office team, you know, process is important, but outcomes are really important. You know, and, and so the office team may be struggling with, you know, why is this project manager standing in my door demanding that I cut a check to subcontractor X? Right. And, and if they had the opportunity to take a step back and understand how important that transaction is to the business, to the success of the project, to the impact on the subcontractor or the impact on the client, um, they have a different perspective on it. And so part of it is just revealing like, what, what are our larger organizational objectives? Yeah. And, and when people know that, um, they can work together much more fruitfully. So have you found in your experience that if, if the executives are articulate and clear in communicating the larger objectives, particularly to folks in the field, what, what have you found the impact of that to be? I'm sorry, can you ask that again? Yeah, so... so one of the things with for, for software, for instance, one of the things for software implementation when you're going to the field with a new piece of software, hopefully you've got their buy-in to begin with, but sometimes there's a sell job that has to happen because you're asking them to do something process-related, which takes them out of their outcome focus, okay? And so you've got to be able to make the case to them in such a way that it's um, in their interest, but also in the interests of the company. So how do the best executives um, pitch, so to speak, make that internal sale to the field, not in such a way that you described earlier, where if you don't get your dailies in, you won't get your paycheck, but there's that bigger picture that's communicated. Um, I, I'm a big fan of show me. Yeah. Right. So if, if you can get the executive team uh, in the same room with the, the superintendents um, and the superintendents are saying, listen, I don't like the way we have to take the picture here and we have to, you know, people will say, I don't like having to put an explanation of what the picture is each time I take a picture on the job site. Interesting. And, and, and I would always say, listen, I'm, I'm only asking you for three words, right? But those three words are golden because otherwise, if I'm looking at a database with a thousand photos, um, I have no way to navigate that database and find the information I need. Um, but if you give me three words, it gives so much more depth and it gives me the ability to actually use those photos. Um, and if the executive team in the organization is willing to actually open the app, take the picture, type in those three words and demonstrate a commitment to doing this and explain why this is so important to the organization, um, you get buy-in. And it goes both ways. Or you basically, you know, we, we, we like to conduct um, our initial meetings with our clients uh, with the entire team we mm. want the top of the organization we want the people from the field we want everybody in the room at the same time to talk about how important this is how important this initiative is to the success of the business excellent so then um for, for you guys for for red team you've 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 come in with the contracts let's say that's a, a starting point where, where do you go next usually uh controlling the money interesting right so I actually always say there, there are three things that a, a contractor has to absolutely get right to yep. be successful. One, you've got to manage your contracts. Uh -huh. Two, you've got to control the money. And three, you have to have leadership and integrity in the field, right? Okay. Without any one of those three things, you're not going to make it. And controlling the money um, is an area where sometimes contractors think, oh, that's an accounting responsibility. It's really not. <laughs> it's really not. It's it's front and center to project management. It's core to project management. You can't run a project without controlling the, the, the money on the job. Um, and that's the general contractor's responsibility to do that. Uh, and so it's particularly important for general contractors because GCs tend to be thinly capitalized entities. <laughs> right? And that's, if you look that's at one way of putting credit, it. <laughs> yeah, surety credit, you know, sureties will give you basically 20 times your book value. So if you think about that, 
you've got basically it's like it's like off balance sheet leverage. Mm -hmm. You've got a, a a company with let's say they've got a, a book value of five million dollars. They can be doing a hundred million dollars of bonded work. Yeah, right. That's extraordinary. Yeah. You know, if you make a mistake, yeah, and you screw up something from a cash flow standpoint, you can go under in a heartbeat. Yes, and and we see it. We see it in the industry. You know, we 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 operate in a very fragmented industry. The supply chain um, is just massive in yeah. the construction business, yeah. and a lot of the companies are very very small. Um, and it would be my prediction that as our infrastructure and our solutions like Red Team, as they get better, I think we'll see the emergence of larger, more stable organizations in construction. I mean, I can't tell you as a contractor how many times I've seen people go out of business, you know, and I, I just not seen that in other industries where I worked, but it's. So, it's, so let it's me ask you about that the larger, larger entities. Do you mean you'll, you'll see, you know, a company rolling up other GCs into a larger entity? Is that what you're saying? I think I think contractors will emerge as larger organizations. I don't know if we'd actually see a roll up where contractors are buying each other. Right. Um, but I do think that um, we'll see a lot more stability in the business. That's interesting because people have been saying that, um, as I'm sure you're aware, for decades, right? Because we are all, you know, we all get frustrated when we look at the industry and think about how productivity hasn't improved and you know the complexity of the business is is such that that. It, it sort of fights against that, that productivity, that rationality, so to speak. Yeah. Well, we say productivity hasn't improved, but safety has. That's and, true. And so that, that I, I do think that that's a counterbalance and, yes. and we've invested in safety as we should. Yes. Uh, and, and so I, I, I sometimes think it's uh, highly critical to just look at productivity numerically and say, well, look at the construction industry has fallen behind so far. Uh, construction contractors are really smart, innovative, creative people, right? And and they they make the impossible happen uh, more often than not. And and I I do think that you know software vendors. There's some software vendors in the world that think that they are the solution that's going to make contractors right. more savvy and smarter. And I I don't think that at all. I think you know we're we're honored to be part of the solution. You know, and I look at platforms like Red Team, and yeah. to me, it's more of a, a quality of life solution than it is a, a solution to make "quote unquote" contractors better. What does that mean? The contractors deliver projects on time and on budget every day. Um, sure, it's a it's a tough business, and sure there are breakdowns and failures, um, but it takes a toll on the people to get that done. Right. And so I I see our job and our opportunity to help relieve some of the stress around that process. You know, we're not going to build the building for our clients, um, but we're going to help them get there in a way that's less stressful, uh, less stressful on them as business owners, less stressful on their teams. Yes. So tell me, do you think it's possible that there is one solution, one software solution for all contracting companies? I, I don't think that. Okay. Um, but but at the same time, I do I do think there are systemic advantages to utilizing platforms. Yeah. Um, one of the you know one of the challenges you know we we've seen in the last few years the adoption of many many point solutions and some of them are are absolutely brilliant. And the, but we do still at times create more silos of information. And so and I hate to use the word integration because I think it's so uh. So, so horribly abused word. In, why do you in, why do you say it's horribly abused? Um, because everyone has a different idea about what integration means. What do you and, mean by it? What I mean is that it, we we create continuous workflows. Okay. Without breakpoints. Okay. Um, and and some software companies will say, "Well, I've got an integration. Look, it it inserts the project name into the other system." Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and my response is always, "Well, so what?" <laughs> Like why, why, tell me why that's good for the subcontractor or the accounting team or the, or the project owner, right? right? So part of the, the benefits of having a platform is these, these, the continuity of these workflows is kind of worked through. Definitely, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we have to integrate our products with other products, um, but how we do it um, is, is really a differentiator. And it's not so much to say, oh, it's integrated, and it's not a box you can just simply check. 
Right. Um, so, so what I would say to anyone looking at buying software pieces that they plan to integrate together is show me how that works. So then do your GCs and, and you sell mainly to GCs, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So do they then require their subs to be on red team as well? How does that work? Uh, they don't know. They, uh, the way we've architected the system, it doesn't require um, subcontractors to actually log in and utilize the platform. And so right. we've built it so that uh, for, for external entities, um, in many ways, it, it, it seems to them that they're receiving and sending email messages, uh, but mm. all that's being captured in our platform. Um, we, we don't want to create a lot of resistance and friction on people getting data into mm -hmm. the platform. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make it as easy as possible. Um, although we have rolled out new, we're rolling out new tools um, for subcontractors, um, things that are beneficial to the contractor and beneficial to the subtrades that are actually performing the work. As you look back on on the the start of your company, as you you move from you know working in a construction company to spinning off Red Team and starting that, if you had to do it all over again, and I'm saying specifically about the software company, what would you do differently? Gosh, people ask me that all the time. They'll say, um, "Are you are you glad you did that?" And I I tongue in cheek, I said, "Listen, if I knew how hard it was going to be, I'm not sure I would have ever gone down that right. path." Right. 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 Um, what, what would I have done differently now in, in retrospect? Because it's been many, many years. I, I may have invested faster. Yeah, right? interesting. Uh, because, you know, I, the way we built it, uh, we built everything incrementally. Yes. Um, and, and there was some mystery as to, well, what, what will be the uptake for this functionality in the marketplace? Yes. Are people willing to pay for this? Yes. And so the uncertainty of all of that um, had us be very cautious about how we invested in building out the platform. Yes. Um, now that I see it, it seems obvious and evident <laughs> that, that contractors are not going to go back to doing things manually. Um, right. They may still have the fax machine in a closet somewhere in the office, um, but honestly, you cannot run a modern construction company without a platform like Red Team to to control the experience of, of all the constituents in a complex construction project. Uh, and it's just, it's just vital. I, I just don't say, see how it can be done. And once contractors actually do adopt a platform, I think they recognize this. Yeah. Um, and they may find it frustrating that they may find it frustrating that this is something that I just have to have to run the business. They've known that about accounting for many years. Uh, and so no one would attempt to, to run a business without an accounting system. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the construction and the, the construction platforms are just as important as that. Um, as, as you reflect upon that fact that you, you would have invested more, how do you know now that um, what you're, because I'm assuming you're talking to your clients, getting feedback from them. How do you know now what to invest in? Talking to clients is a big part of that. I, yeah. I, one of my things is I, I like to speak to a client at least once a day. And so not a day goes by that I don't have a conversation with, with a client right. or, or a prospect. Um, and so it's, it's very important to me just to keep that ongoing dialogue and, and connection with, mm -hmm. with people that are utilizing our platform so that we have a, a clear direction on how to build out the future uh, like I said earlier, you know, the, the, one of the most important things about selecting a partner to provide your platform is, you know, do you connect well? Like, do you, do you have the same values and beliefs about the industry that are going to make you good partners uh, for the business as you go into the future? Yep. L let me ask you this then. Let's talk about the future real quick. Um, put on your, uh, I don't know, your wave your magic wand, look into your crystal ball. Where do you see construction and technology five years from now? Uh, five years from now, I think there will be, we, I think we'll always be seeing new innovative point solutions. I think the point solutions, uh, integrating those point solutions into the platform, I think is, is vital. Tell me what uh, you mean by point solutions, just for my, my own sake. Okay, so a point solution would be a, a piece of software that, let's say it, it manages a, a drone survey on your job site. Okay. okay. Right. So, so that addressing that data, a specific issue, very specific issue. Yeah. And it, it may be brilliant at solving that one use case, that one business case. Yes. Um, but that data is living in a silo. So long as it's in that 
that yeah. standalone platform. Yeah. And so, uh, and at the risk of using the term that I, I told you I don't like very much, <laughs> you know, it's our job as software vendors to make sure there's interoperability and that there's integration across all these options because contractors have unique needs, unique focuses, and they, they ultimately, they, they will have to have uh, a number of point solutions to supplement their, their oper their business operations. Yes. Um, and, and we should make it easy to integrate that information into our platform without necessarily having to recreate it. And I think we should look at even competing applications and, and support all that interactivity. Is part of your strategy as Red Team to, to find those point solutions and then um, purchase them? Is Because I know some, some of the software guys, that's what they do, right? They, they find you know, the latest and the greatest and they just roll it, you know, buy, it, buy the guys out. Is, are, do you guys have that perspective? That, uh, that does happen. Uh, we, we've only done it once, to, to be clear. I don't know that that would be standard operating procedure. I do think that there, there are functionalities that really are core to the platform, yeah. uh, that, that it makes sense to maybe acquire um, a, a solution like that and integrate it into the platform. It's, it's incredibly difficult to, to merge disparate uh, software applications, yes, especially web applications. Yes, and so the the architecture of the the platforms is is really important when you look at a a potential a potential acquisition, uh, and so even if we were to buy something and integrate it into our platform, I I'm still of the opinion that we should maintain our partner relationships with the competing point solutions. Okay, excellent. So, Michael, you've been very generous with your time. Tell us a little bit more about Red Team. Oh, well, you know, I, I told you the, the origin story, um, yeah. really what's, what's probably most unique about Red Team is the number of actual construction folks we have in the organization. <laughs> so, you know, when- They're not just geeks in skinny jeans. <laughs> that, that's it. You know, we, we actually give everybody a hard hat. Nice. Red Team. And, and we make it clear that we are not, this may, this may sound wrong, but I always say, we're not a tech company. We're a construction company. Nice. I don't. Th I think that sounds and, great. I have no and, problem and with that. So I, I, I never, I, I never want to lose focus on that. And and one of the things that we do spend a fair amount of time talking about is, like, just the the amount of risk and the amount of stress that there is in construction. Yeah. Yeah. So the quality of life really is a, a very important deliverable for us as a company. Very interesting. Um, and I share, you know, my own war stories from, you know, being on job sites in the middle of the night and having problems that, you know, I, I didn't know how I was going to solve it in the moment of actually trying to solve them. And, and so there's a high level of empathy for the people that we serve. And, and I think that's really distinctive about how we operate as a business. Yeah, that's interesting. I've, you know, I've talked with lots of folks about software and, and uh, people in your space, and I've never had someone frame it that way in terms of the quality of life. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, now, you're out in Florida. Is that right, Michael? Yeah, we're in Orlando, Florida. So it's, it's a lot of fun, a lot of things to do here. Great. Well, um, so if I'm visiting Orlando, if, if somehow I get sucked in by my kids to go into Disney World, what's the one non Disney type restaurant I should hit just to make myself feel better for that long journey. Oh. <laughs> I'm out in California. <laughs> oh, you know, I just, I just flew back from California last night. Beautiful, beautiful. I was in San Diego. Fantastic oh, beautiful. Yeah. Weather yep. there. yeah. yeah. Um, so a great restaurant. So if you, if you come to Orlando and you spend time at the parks, either Disney or universal, um, one of the things you may not know as a, as a tourist is that, that's not really Orlando. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Orlando is about 20, 25 minutes uh, northish from the from the mm -hmm. attractions. And so if you're going to go into uh, Orlando proper, I would say check out a place called Osprey Tavern. Mm -hmm. Osprey Tavern. Tavern, yep. Osprey is in the bird. Osprey is in the bird, yeah. Excellent. Great place. Um, you know, I, I, I do know the owner. Um, fantastic restaurant. Excellent, excellent. So it's folks definitely get... off. It's not on the uh, it's not on the tourist trail. So okay. you have to go downtown. Excellent, excellent. So if folks want to get in touch with you, Michael, how can they get in touch with you guys? Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Obviously, uh, redteam.com. Yep, it's probably the best way. Excellent. And why do why do you call the company Red Team? I'm just curious. Uh, so prior to being in the uh, construction business, I worked in the aerospace business, and many of our projects were for the uh, military. Huh. And so red team is actually a wargaming term. Ah. 
And I always like the name. It's, 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 it's a cool name, um, but it's also a process of taking a hard look at your circumstances and figuring out how to exploit your advantages and, and mitigate your risk. And, and so that the notion of red teaming um, is something that is uh, part of managing military infrastructure and managing uh, um, military wargaming, um, but it's also a great business process. Excellent, excellent. Do you have, well, let me ask you this then, do you have any um, book recommendations around that process that you might wanna to give to the audience? If you don't, it's okay. I, I know I'm kind of throwing you a curveball there, but it just yeah. sounded kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that somebody's written a book on red teaming. I'm not sure I've read it though. Yeah, so. yeah, right. No problem. Excellent. I was just checking out the Ospreys uh, uh, website and those oysters that they serve. Those look pretty good. <laughs> yeah, place, yeah, place is fantastic. So come visit. Beautiful. Michael, well, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your generosity here today. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. This is Eric. Just before you jet off, thank you again for listening to Construction Genius. Make sure that you connect with Michael right on LinkedIn and also check out redteam.com for more information about his company, Red Team. Thanks again for listening to Construction Genius here today. Um, I deeply appreciate each and every one of you who listens on a regular basis. Um, it's amazing to me when I run into people who listen to um, Construction Genius. I've never met them before and they say, Eric, I really appreciate the show. And um, I just want to say that I appreciate you for listening to the show. So feel free to share it with other people that you know who may benefit from the content. Uh, give us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. And once again, thanks for listening to, Con to Construction Genius. And I'll catch you on the next episode.